How are you? How are you all? I can't really see you because basically being blinded by light. So, but uh, so, have you been enjoying it so far? Uh, so I can hear you, so that's good. So my name is Matthew Griffin. I'm the CEO and founder of the 311 Institute. So people often describe me as a futurist, but I'm actually a futurist and a strategic advisor working with all the brands that you have on your person today as well as in your mind. So I look at two kinds of futures. I look at what I regard as the future, which is the next 20 years. So that's where the vast majority of organizations typically spend their time. So that's the next one, two, three, four, five, 10, 20 years. But I also work with all G20 governments, and this is where we look at deep futures, which go up to 50 years out, because we're increasingly interested in what the future of the welfare state the future of education, jobs and skills, transport, energy and so forth actually will look like. So in this particular presentation, I thought I would do this. It's something I don't normally do. How do you win the future as individuals and businesses? So when we actually have a look at the future, I do a variety of different things. So I help blueprint the next 50 years of countries, so all countries like the UAE, UK, USA, and so on and so forth. I also launched a free university, because as you will see through this presentation, the way that we are preparing our students and children, basically, for this future that we have rapidly approaching us is not up to snuff, as we say in the UK. And you'll see what I mean there. And then in terms of the companies that I work with, I work with organizations like Visa on the future of money and payments. I work with organizations like Adobe, basically where we are reinventing the PDF and the document, which is actually a little bit harder than you think. Uh, organizations basically like Samsung, basically that you might have on your person now, we typically talk in terms of Samsung, we talk up to 2069 uh, because that's their centennial. I uh, also work with many 5G organizations on the future of 5G, 6G, 7G, and low Earth orbit satellite systems. Now, this is the agenda that I've sort of put together. Now, I'm going to be talking about the prepared leader, the digital opportunity, which is not what you think, at least I hope it's not what you think. Everything's changing, everything's changing fast, and then how you future-proof your company, your staff, but also yourselves. So when we have a look at the future, there's a lot going on. There are hundreds of mega trends. There are hundreds of exponential technologies. So for example, when we look at climate change, climate change is just one mega trend that we are all being subjected to, whether we like it or not. When we have a look at technology, artificial intelligence is one technology out of hundreds. So if you sort of scan this QR code, you can download these books, they're free, and they will tell you what these trends are and technologies are, why you might care, what they could do for you or to you, and how you might be able to react. But while it's all very well talking about the future of trends and technologies and me saying that the only thing that's changing is everything, what I've done is I turned these books into a little video. Each trend, each technology is on the screen for a quarter of a millisecond. This is what you are looking at when you are looking at what the future means and what it could be.
So when I say that I'm only going to be looking at a little bit of the future, basically, I'm not kidding, is it? Because all these things are here today. And the only thing that that two-minute video does is change every single part of global business, culture, and society. Whether it's your professional lives, your personal lives, your businesses, your countries, basically, and so on and so forth. So the first thing, basically, when we're having a look at the future to realize, basically, is that the old rules no longer apply, whether that is in business or in life. As we look at the future, we already generally understand that we are moving today faster than we did 10 years ago. So the pace of societal, business, and cultural change today is faster than it has ever been. By 2030, it's going to be moving faster still, which means we're accelerating in terms of global change and local change. Which, from a personal and professional perspective, means that you have less time to predict the future. Understand what that future could mean for you and adapt to it. And that's an issue. This is why globally, more people around the world are anxious about the future than ever before. This is why businesses are now undertaking the process of creative destruction where they are literally trying to destroy and disrupt their businesses from within because they know that they are going to be disrupted either by themselves or by someone else. The future is also more complex because, for example, what happens if you combine climate change, basically with the future of agriculture, with the metaverse, basically, and 5G, you know, et cetera, et cetera. When you start combining all of these different technologies and trends together, it gets really complicated really fast. However, as everything changes, if you can see it and you can understand it, and you get a point of view, you'll see that opportunity is everywhere. And I'm going to show you what I mean by that, and I'm going to give you examples. Now, organizations like ARK Investment estimate that emerging technology will destroy over $50 trillion worth of global GDP. We've already seen this, for example, in the oil and gas sector. If you're an organization like BP or Exxon and you have hundreds of billions of dollars worth of assets, increasingly as we move from oil, an oil-fueled economy to a renewable energy economy, the value of those assets decreases. Same with the manufacturing industry, same with the automotive industry, same with banks. But it's also estimated that emerging technology will create over $210 trillion of new, new money or new opportunity. To visualize the technologies that are coming down the line, I use this starburst. There are 170 exponential technologies, basically, on this chart, organized into 13 categories spanning 50 years. So if you want to make a product, you need manufacturing. You might need biotech. You need compute. You need con to connect it, maybe, to a 5G network. You need electronics. You need to power it. You need intelligence in the form of artificial intelligence, perhaps. Materials to make it with. Robotics. You need to secure it. You need to put sensors into it. And you need a user experience on top of it. So when you start combining all these different technologies together, this creates your next generation product or service. This lets you disrupt your competitors or them disrupt you, as well as allowing you to move into new markets. So for example, 3D printing disrupts the $10 trillion manufacturing industry. Number six, bioreactors solves global famine. And I'll show you how. But when we have a look at number six, for example, today, basically, we passed the eight billionth person on the planet. So today, baby number eight billion was born. So we now have a global population of over eight billion. By 2030, that'll be 8.6 billion. Number six is how we feed them. When we look at biotech, I'll talk about that, but we have regenerative medicine, we have smart drugs, we've got synthetic DNA, basically, that's coming through. We've got gene drives, in vivo gene therapy that lets us do new things. When we have a look at things like compute, if you think that quantum computers are the most powerful computers on the earth, 
it looks like the most powerful computers on Earth will actually be DNA and biological-based computers because we've already built them. We also have chemical computers, liquid computers, where the computer chips are liquid and the storage is liquid. Neuromorphic computers, we have computers made out of polymers. So if you think that the computers in your smartphones and your pockets basically will always be silicon or something else, one day they could be biological. Reconfiguring electronics, energy, huge amounts of investment based going into energy. When we have a look at artificial intelligence, we've already 3D printed an artificial intelligence. We've also created an artificial intelligence out of DNA. So AI is not necessarily going to be binary or quantum based. Robots, security, user experiences, memory transfer, we've already done that. Memory uploading, we've already done that. Virtual reality, we've stepped way beyond virtual reality. Holodecks basically are being made by organizations in America and so on and so forth. But this wheel is actually in the codexes, so you can uh, have a look at all these different things. Molecular assemblers. Toyota have been using molecular assemblers, which are viruses in their case, to make the latest lithium-ion batteries for their new electric vehicles, and so on and so forth. So we already live in science fiction times, but when we actually have a look at the industries that are being disrupted, they're all being disrupted. Agriculture. I have a surprise up my sleeve later but we can grow crops in vertical farms using 100% less potable water because we can extract water from the air. These crops are organic, eight times the yield, 350 times less space they take up, and you can grow them in any city, so they're more sustainable. They're also guaranteed because these crops aren't going to be destroyed by drought like we've seen across Europe and even here. When we have a look at construction in the UAE, we are about to 3D print an 11-story skyscraper. When we have a look at the energy industry, we're obviously moving from fossil fuels to renewable energy, nuclear energy, hydrogen, and so on and so forth. But this is part of a $92 trillion shift by the year 2050. When we have a look at financial services, we have banks moving to bank four. We have fintechs that are essentially just current banks, but with fancy user interfaces. Um, we have decentralized finance. So if any of your children use Roblox, Fortnite, or Minecraft, Fortnite has 350 million users. They make 95% of their money from microtransactions, so that's your children buying skins and avatars and equipment and that kind of stuff. Using decentralized finance, Fortnite could say to your children, would you like a savings card? Would you like a credit card? Would you like a mortgage for your virtual reality land in the metaverse? So ironically, the future competitors to banks could actually be the game platforms. And we actually have conversations about that, basically, with organizations like the SEC and so on. When we have a look at healthcare, we have a technology called CRISPR. We can go into your body, put you onto an IV drip, a genetic engineering solution, clips out your bad gene if you have an inherited genetic condition, clips in the good gene, you no longer have it. So we've already performed in vivo genetic re-engineering in patients. We did that years ago. We can also 3D print human organs. We also have universal organ transplants coming through. So when we have a look at biotech, by the year 28, 2028, we will be able to add more than a year's worth of life to you for every year that you live, which means that these developments in the healthcare space start putting you on course to living to over 100 years, where 100 is the new 60, where by 2050 we could be extending the human lifespan to 125, which fundamentally changes things like wealth management, estate planning, pensions and savings and everything else. 
When we have a look at manufacturing, we see massive advances in robotics, industry 4.0. When we actually have a look at retail and media and entertainment, increasingly media and entertainment products are being made by artificial intelligence. So the media and entertainment industry is a $6 trillion industry. And if you follow things like deep fakes, for example, then artificial intelligence is already creating articles, podcasts, podcasts that never end, books, music. Warner and Sony have signed up artificial intelligence-based musicians where the AIs make music and that music is then just streamed to Spotify. So media and entertainment is, is set to change in a big way. When we have a look at retail, there's lots sort of going on in retail, but over in Hong Kong, one of the biggest landlords actually runs a virtual reality mall with 45,000 stores in it. So the kids basically over in Asia go into a virtual reality mall, which was especially popular, as you can imagine, during the pandemic, go into the Lego shop, go into Prada, buy products, and then have them delivered. So e-commerce is changing as well, but that's just a snippet. When we have a look at communications, we have 5G, we have 6G already in the works with organizations like Samsung and the IEEE Alliance, but we also have low Earth or orbit satellites. So as we throw 12,000 satellites into low Earth orbit, we connect the other 3.5 billion people on the planet. But from a business perspective, that doubles your opportunity because that's now 7 billion-ish people who can access your digital services from anywhere on the planet. And then when we actually have a look at transportation, the only thing that's changing there is everything is going autonomous and everything is going either electric or hydrogen, so alternative fuels. But however, as every organization digitizes itself, the fact of the matter is that irrespective of what industry that you work in or represent, you are all becoming technology companies. I bet there is not a single one of you that's not building some form of software, digitizing your operations, incorporating IoT and sensor systems basically into your back office or front office. So every company, irrespective of sector, is now becoming a technology company. It's a fundamentally different opportunity. It's a fundamentally different way of thinking about yourselves. So from a leader's perspective, we now live in what many regard as the most complex business environment ever. Massive inflation, massive cost of living increases, supply chain issues, wars. Econ economic problems, geopolitical problems, basically as we start moving to a bipolar world, basically where we have the US and China and then Europe somewhere in the middle trying to figure something out. So we are now in the most complex business environment ever, which means that from a CEO's perspective, we have this problem. CEOs today now only directly influence 45% of what happens to their business. Things like hiring, product development, and everything else. 55% of what happens to your companies is now happening from external factors, external trends, like sustainability and ESG. It's external to the business. Now, this also means, basically, that as individuals and businesses, we need a kind of new approach. And it's a bit of a problem. Because on the one hand, with all these changes, your organization needs to be able to be resistant to changes. So if something happens, you need to have a resilient core that means that you don't suddenly topple. However, because of all these changes, your organization also needs to be flexible. If there is a change, sometimes you need to be able to pivot on a dime. Maybe there's a new regulation, like we've seen with Mercedes and Volkswagen. Across Europe, sales of combustion engine vehicles are being banned from 2035. Suddenly, you need to move from making this type of thing to this kind of thing, serving this kind of market and serving that kind of market. So this is a balancing act. You need to be resilient 
and flexible. That's an issue. Now, from a leadership perspective, ask yourself these questions. In the last 18 months, how many new products have you introduced within your company? If the answer is none, then you're not growing outside your core, and maybe you're not spotting new opportunities. How much of the company have you reinvented? Because with all of this disruption happening, if you don't reinvent yourselves, you're going to get crushed. If you do reinvent yourselves, though, you have a lot of opportunities. And then can you prove that you move, can move at speed? So if I gave you a massive opportunity today, how quickly could you move into that new market? Because, for example, with banks, before banks moved to DevOps and cloud and everything else, they would typically say, well, if we saw a new market opportunity, it would take us two years to move into it, by which point it's gone. These markets are moving very, very quickly. So you need to move from hierarchies within your business to networks, industries to ecosystems. If you want to pivot into a new market, use partners. It's a great way to do it, and cheap. Managers to leaders and agile business, where agile business, for example, is you have to have a digital core top to bottom. And no, I do not sell digital stuff. Now, in terms of the digital opportunity, also consider this. If I ask a bank what industry they're in, they say, well, we're in the business of selling loans and investments and all that kind of stuff. If I ask a retailer what they do, they say, well, we sell products. If I ask a technology company what business they are in, like Facebook, Amazon, Google, Apple, Baidu, Alibaba. They say every industry. So what we have is we've got technologies that are converging, sectors that are converging, because as you become a digital business, being a digital company lets you see an opportunity over here and quickly go and attack it and maybe own it. So this is where we actually increasingly have the end of sectors. You are no longer in agriculture or communications. I'm going to give you an example on that. You are now in the technology business. Financial, financial services organizations like JP Morgan are starting to learn from the big multi-sided platform companies like Facebook and so on and so forth. JP Morgan is a bank but they created a travel company. Their travel company is estimated to be the third largest in the USA. And the reason for that is they can be there as a company when their clients book holidays with JP Morgan. So they can provide financing and credit card services and everything else. It also takes JP Morgan into a completely new kind of demographic, new customers. But it also lets them compete head-to-head -head with American Express. Starts eating into American Express's share. But if JP Morgan weren't a digital bank top to bottom, if the culture of the organization was, we are a bank, they now wouldn't be moving into these new markets. Every organization can move into new markets, and I'll show you how. Vodacom, so I speak quite regularly to Vodacom, now, we all know that Vodafone is a telecommunications company, right? Vodacom is in the payments business. They're actually providing financial services, basically, to people in South Africa. Now, MTN, if you know South Africa, or if you know Africa, MTN is another telco, telco provider across the continent. They have 50 million subscribers. MTN is becoming a bank because they have a digital core they see an opportunity over here, and they move into it. So the story of Vodacom, well, I can share that with you later, if you like. Now, is Neo, for those of you that know Neo, you can do a hands up. I can't quite see, but is Neo a car company? Hands up. OK. Is Neo a food company? Okay. Not many hands up for a food company, OK. Some people might have heard of Neo. Or is Neo a lifestyle company? Any hands up for a lifestyle company? See, not really. Or is Neo all of the above? Oh, so we've got what, five, six. 
So NIO is a Chinese electric vehicle manufacturer. But because they're a digital business, they are creating a super app. They are all of that and more. In fact, NIO, who make electric vehicles, now sell over a million lines of food. They sell lifestyle services, connected home products, insurance. NIO, most people think, is a car company. They are not a car company. Because when you digitize yourselves, you can see a market over here, and you just add that new market into your app, and all of a sudden you're providing food, or whatever it happens to be. Now, in the future, so last week I was in Helsinki. I was speaking to a 1,000 car dealerships because electric vehicles don't need as much maintenance and servicing as a traditional internal combustion engine car. I said there will be no car companies in the future. I also showed basically the car companies basically in Finland that they didn't actually know what the future of cars actually looked like, which was fun. So there will be no car companies, but there will be this. Car companies, like Mercedes, in the future will be multi-sided, super app technology companies that also provide mobile services, like car as a service, mobile as a service, and so on. And the reason for that is this. Technology lets us do new things in new ways and enter new markets. <clears throat> this is Hyundai's car. Toyota have one, Lightspeed have one. These are photovoltaic panels. So firstly, this car doesn't really have many lithium-ion batteries in it. That's where most people would end. You just think this is a different kind of electric vehicle. This is where a futurist starts. This car generates its own electricity. It is an energy utility that generates its own electricity, right? So Hyundai now has vehicles that generate their own electricity. BMW then used blockchain technology and wireless energy transmission to become an energy distributor. So using the same principles, this car generates its own electricity, and then just like you wirelessly charge your phone, wirelessly charges the other cars around it and charges them for the electricity that it's just shared with them. Right? But if I went to BMW and said, oh, you're going to be in the energy business, they go, no, we're not. We have the technology. This moves them into a $10 trillion market. But we go further. This is a Tesla Model 3. It has a huge number of lithium-ion batteries. Is Tesla a car company or are they a power company? Because you plug these in at home in California, and when the Californian electricity grid runs low and needs a boost, which is where it needs more electricity, we take the electricity out of this car and feed it to the Californian electricity grid. So Tesla is actually a virtual power plant company because it can aggregate together all of the electricity in these cars, and essentially, they're a distributed virtual power plant. That is a real business for Tesla, by the way. When these cars drive themselves, Tesla becomes a taxi company. Tesla and SpaceX also own an increasing number of thousands of low Earth orbit satellites. So you'll buy your Tesla, and Tesla will say, would you like us to provide your home broadband with that? And then you say, yes or no. So Tesla could end up being your communications provider. So when I say we have the death of boundaries, I'm not kidding. Everything is changing as well. We have three economies right now. The physical economy, which we all know and love. The digital economy, which we all buy as a subscription. And the virtual economy. The virtual economy is different to the digital economy. It's worth about $13 trillion. You can think of this as kind of virtual reality, metaverse, NFTs, Web3, that kind of stuff. But they're all different, but they all start coming together. And I'll show you how. So when I was with the bosses of Adidas, in three hours, 
they sold $25 million of virtual sneakers. So if you went back to Adidas about five years ago and said, in the future, you will be selling virtual trainers, they'd go, why? And you're an idiot. Now, this is a whole line of business. But they can sell the physical trainer, the virtual trainer, and all sorts of things. And these trainers can morph. They can be a collectible, et cetera, et cetera. That's why I say we have three economies, physical, digital, and virtual. They are different. Each have their own benefits. Coca-Cola, who are one of my clients, they did this. This is the Pixel Coca-Cola. It's what we call a five-digital product, a physical and digital product. Now, what we mean by that is you buy Pixel-flavored Coca-Cola in Roblox, you drink it, your avatar drinks it, it gives you an energy boost, so you can run around Roblox faster. Coca-Cola then give you a QR code, and you can then go down to, say, for example, a Carrefour, and pick up the real can of Coca-Cola. A Phi digital product. It's a digital product, a virtual product, and a physical product. Johnny Walker, so Diageo, another client of mine. This is a very rare 48-year-old bottle of whiskey. It's worth about 5,000 pounds, 4,000, 5,000 pounds by itself. But they sold it along with a $35,000 NFT. And an NFT is what we call a non-fungible token. If you think about a regular token like a ticket that you might get at the cinema, a physical ticket, it's kind of like that. But it's just digital, and it provides you access to different things. So in this case, you buy your $35,000 bottle of whiskey as an NFT, and now you get access to different experiences and everything else. When we look at payments, the future of payments is very different to what you think. At the moment, basically, you pay with euros. If you're Nike, you can pay for your virtual merchandise using moves. So as I move around this stage, I get tracked by Nike. And they say, you've now done 5 million miles walking around stage. Congratulations, you can buy a virtual hoodie that flies. So when we look at payments, this is where we have what we call X to earn. Your children are doing this. They play games to earn money, move to earn money, where money is just value. It's something that I trade with you for something else. It's not necessarily a euro or a dollar. And talking about money itself, we're buying mortgages or buying houses over in the US with Bitcoin. Okay? Now, that might just look like a Bitcoin purchase, but to a futurist, if we all agree to trade with one another using Bitcoin or a presenter's stick, if you see that this has value or perceive this has value, and we all trade using presentation sticks, if you never cash out your Bitcoin, or whatever it happens to be, your store of value, do you need the euro? If you never cash out, you never need the euro. You only need whatever it is that you're transacting with. In which case, is fiat currency not the future of money? We have Mercedes that has digital humans that are selling its cars. We have Adidas that are 3D printing sneakers in the back of stores. They no longer need to make 100 trainers in China, ship 100 trainers, and shred 60 million trainers when they don't get sold. This one technology eliminates their entire inventory and most of their supply chain. Because you walk in, you measure your foot, you select the trainer you want, it gets 3D printed in the back of the store. Adidas no longer need their supply chains in the same way that they did, and they no longer need inventory, and they're making 65% more profit because of it. When we have a look at how we feed the 8 billion people that we have on the planet now, cultivated meat, aka cellular agriculture, we are told that we will have wars in 2050 over water and food. Or we're told we have to eat plants or insects or both in order to survive. 
This is a simple concept. I take the cell from a chicken, put it into the technology I called out earlier, called a bioreactor, and I produce chicken nuggets. So I produce chicken without the animal. And I can do this with any animal. I can do it with a cow, with a zebra, with a tuna, with a salmon. I can take the cell from a salmon, put it into a bioreactor, and grow a salmon fillet. If you want to buy these, you can go to Singapore, you can go to the US. There are loads of companies doing this. In the future, you don't need to eat insects or plants. You can eat actual meat, but you don't need to deforest the Amazon rainforest any longer because you don't need the cows. If you don't need the cows, you don't need to feed them crops. You don't need to give them water. Bearing in mind, agriculture uses 70% of all of the world's water today and generates 20% of all greenhouse gas emissions. When we have a look at this, we can 3D print different organs. We 3D printed bone, cartilage, muscle, Corneas. In Israel, they 3D printed, albeit a small one, a living, beating human heart, which they reckon will be commercially available in terms of human-sized by 2030. In the UK, if you have cancer, we can 3D print you out new bones and new tissues, so kidneys, increasingly parts of lungs. We can 3D print parts of brains as well. So this is where we start talking about life extension. Because at the moment, you have to wait for someone to die before you get an organ transplant. But what happens if I have your stem cells on file and I just print you out a new organ? Now, if we start combining 5G, robotics, and mixed reality, I'm now in Brasov, in, in Bras excuse my Romanian. I'm now in Brasov. I need a, I need a transplant, right? Okay, except for the fact that one of the biggest problems that we actually have is my surgeon might be down in Cape Town. Now, using 5G and telerobotics, that surgeon in Cape Town can operate remotely on me while I'm in Brasov. Now, this is important for two reasons. Firstly, this is future of work. When you think about working from anywhere, you're thinking about working in finance and being able to take your laptop to the beach, right? But when we have a look at new teleoperations technologies, you can be a surgeon in Cape Town operating on people in Brasov or in Dubai. Construction workers can use this same technology. And in Germany, a company called Dusan had a drone rig set up in Munich. And people sat in this drone vehicle. And that vehicle was operating vehicles in South Korea. So we had construction workers based in Germany building buildings in South Korea. So when we start talking about decentralizing the future of work, it's not just for your standard jobs. It's for a whole range of jobs you'd never thought you could actually decentralize. We've also managed to sequence the human genome in the United States in less than five hours that opens up a huge new world of personalized medicine. Now, sequencing people's genomes in five hours has meant that we've been able to create personalized cancer therapies for people with bowel cancer and pancreatic cancer, but those therapies have been 100% effective at completely eliminating grade four tumors. This is a massive healthcare shift, massive. And then we've been able to re-engineer both babies that would have been born with inherited genetic conditions in vivo, as well as re-engineer people who already have genetic conditions in vivo. Now, CRISPR, which is the technology involved here, could end up eliminating over 6,000 currently incurable diseases. That boosts human longevity. Everything's changing fast. When we have a look at the power of the individual, so we, took, we heard from entrepreneurs earlier, it is now faster and cheaper for you as an entrepreneur, if you have an idea, to build a business. Because we are all increasingly digitally connected to one another, 
you can get access to capital as an entrepreneur faster than ever before, whether it's crowdfunding or whether it's angels or seed money or series A, whatever it happens to be money. You can also get access to expertise faster than ever before because if you need an expert, you can find them online, you can contact them, and if they reply, they can help you. You also have access to resources. So as entrepreneurs and as individuals, you are now the most powerful versions of yourselves that could have ever lived because you can have an idea, get the money for the idea, the resources for the idea, and the expertise to build whatever product it is faster than ever before. But from a market perspective, you can scale that idea faster than ever before. Because if you can execute, execute properly, that's the challenge. That's why you need entrepreneurial communities and mentors basically to help you figure out how you execute. If you can execute, then you can scale that idea to three and a half billion connected people by the end of the day. So you have access to expertise, money, and markets that your parents could only have ever dreamed about. But in terms of speed, when we have a look at the financial services market, Facebook in June 2019 created DM, which is their cryptocurrency. Now, had it been approved by the regulators, it would have changed the global financial services industry overnight and eliminated the state's control of money. The reason for that is because Mark Zuckerberg could have released Libra at 9 a.m. in the morning. Had he executed correctly, over 2 billion people on Facebook could have been using that cryptocurrency by the end of the day, or even by the end of the hour. So the chairman of the People's Bank of China the chairman of the European Central Bank, the chairman of the Bank of England, and the chairman of the US Fed said this would have eliminated the state's control of money and changed the global financial services industry overnight. So we are already at the point where using technology, digitization, and connectivity, we can change a major industry overnight. And then when we talk about future-proofing yourselves, but also your businesses, these are sort of three straightforward slides. So the first thing that you do is get some insights, go to briefings, go to sessions like this, round tables, scenarios, go out and explore. Irrespective of what profession you're in or what industry you're in, go and explore the future and stuff. Get outside your comfort zone, get outside of your own industry, because the thing that's going to disrupt you isn't from your industry anyway. You bring all those insights and that data together as a team, and you create your new future strategy as a company. So you've got to think about your company culture. If you have the right company culture, that's 80% of the challenge right there. Because a boss that says, the future's over there, we're going over there, the whole company will follow. But a boss that says, the future's over there, but I don't care, and we're going to stay in here, you never get to the future. So com company culture is really important. Purpose and vision. So build your strategy. Bear in mind, if everything's accelerating, if you have a 10-year strategy, it's actually a seven-year strategy in the real world. A five-year strategy is a three-year strategy. Choose your target market, so you now know what you need to go after. This is your target market. Figure out your future operating model. So if we were going after that market, what kind of business would we need to look like? That's your operate. That's your Tom, as they say. Is this operating model, is it already existing, or do you need some new things on, as part of your operating model? Do you need new, a new hierarchy, new lines of business and everything else? And do you need new ICT systems? So is, you, is your technology stack where it needs to be? If it isn't, figure out where the gaps are. You then have your multiple lines of businesses to go after these new markets. So you need products, targets, and your employees need tasks to do. So if we're going after this new market, what products are we going to sell, and what tasks do we need to do, and what skills do our employees need? And then we get to this. 
So products, what's the required functionality? Do you need to buy this functionality? Maybe it's just cheaper to buy a product so you can go into this new market, or do you want to build it yourself? In which case, what skills do you need in-house to build this new product or new thing? And then again, if you're building your new product, do you have the existing skills in-house, or do you have new skills? Now, for example, one of my clients is Pepsi. Uh, so there, what we actually look at doing, basically, is when we need new skills, we look within the organization, send out emails via what they call the preposterous lab, and say, we need someone with these skills. Have you got that? Because actually, most of the people within your business, or quite a number of people within your business, are probably already doing this new thing as a hobby, say, like crafting an NFT or something like that. Now, from a role's perspective, what are the competencies? So you've got your product. What are the hard skills that your staff need? And what are the soft skills? Again, are they existing skills? Say, for example, we see the future. In the future, we have quantum data scientists. Well, you might, not, you might have data scientists that know their stuff. But they might not know how to put together quantum artificial intelligence models, especially prevalent in insurance and banking if you're in that. So how do you go and acquire those skills? And this is kind of the sort of the straightforward model. There's always, like onions, there's always layers to this, and there's depth and everything else. But fundamentally, this, you know, once you've spotted your opportunity, craft your vision, find your target market, figure out what products you need to build, how to build them, and who you need to build them, and how to sell them. Understand the gaps. Look within your company for people who can fill those gaps and help you, basically, with these goals. And if there's no one within your company, partner with somebody who's already done it before or who has that expertise. And then go and win the future. So I hope you enjoyed the presentation. That, as I say, was just kind of the cherry on top. That's it. There's a lot more to the future than, you, than I've sort of spoken about. But uh, thank you very much for listening.